Welcome back, my elegant warriors. I am so excited. Now in this season, this is the first author that we are having on, and you know I love to talk to authors, and this book is one that I am going to be encouraging you to read here and on my social media. It is called Radical Humility, Be a Badass Leader and a Good Human, and it's by Oris Koenig. He's a former United Nations peacekeeper, but he's more than that. I actually have to read his bio because it's so impressive. I want you guys to know every little bit of it. He is a former United Nations military peacekeeper and a NATO military peacekeeping commander, a highly accomplished ultra endurance champion, a widely published professor, and a seasoned executive coach and keynote speaker with more than three decades of experience helping hundreds of leaders and dozens of executive teams unlock new levels of achievement across four continents. Welcome, Ors. Thank you, Heather, for having me. Oh my gosh, it's so good to have you. I was telling you before we hit record how much I enjoyed this book and how much I enjoyed reading and having a conversation around humility, because that's not a word that we see or hear a lot in the personal development slash business books. Tell us why radical humility? Well, so first of all, thank you. Thank you again for having me, Heather. So on a personal level, I've always been drawn to people in my athletic career, academic career, in business who were humble, who were highly successful, but who shone the light on their teams and step out of the spotlight and who never stopped learning. So that's sort of, I was always drawn to, to these people. But then as an executive coach, as you were mentioning in the intro, I sort of experienced my clients coming out of the financial crisis when social media started to explode, to be constantly overwhelmed, always two, three steps behind. And there, a lot of them were still leading top down, command control, you know, very traditional leadership. And that sort of got me thinking about that doesn't really work anymore. We need to think of, about leadership a bit differently. And of course, you know, servant leadership has been around for a long time, but that got me starting to think about humility in leadership. And then two things happened for all of us. One, the COVID crisis happened. And then, you know, when the world shut down, we all had to humbly admit that we don't know what the future holds. And, you know, we have so little control, really, over our own lives. And then I deployed on these two peacekeeping missions you uh, mentioned in the intro. And the experience in these missions showed me that even in a very traditional and hierarchical environment like the military, a more relational, bottom-up leadership is actually what drives results. And that sort of got me digging into humility and leadership. And then, you know, the, the result of that digging in that quest is, is, is the book. So, uh, um, yeah. And, the, and your experience in Kosovo, I mean, the, the stories that you tell about that in the book are just so compelling and lead you into all of the ideas that you share in a really beautiful way. So for the readers, for the listeners who are ultimately going to be readers, I want you to know that the book in some ways reads like a novel. You know, there's parts about it, about the peacekeeping missions and the things that you've done that are really compelling. And you just want to keep reading just to hear what's going on there. And then you share what you call your five shifts. Um, into now leadership. Now you make this sort of um, comparison slash continuum between radical humility and now leadership. Tell the listeners what now leadership is all about. So, well, let's start with then leadership. So then is what I call heroic leadership. It's top-down, command control, old-school leadership. And by the way, I fully own this a slight simplification of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of the world because it's a model. And then now leadership is leading with radical humility. So now leadership, what I call now leadership, is leading with radical humility. And leading with radical humility really has three main pillars. It's an accurate self-knowledge, sort of self-awareness we talk a lot about in executive coaching and leadership development. So seeing myself in line with how others see me. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is leading relationally. So as leaders, we're facing an inversion of expertise today, right? Our people always know so much more than we ever can about their area of expertise. So for them to come to us with the data and information we need, the good, the bad, and the ugly, they need to trust us. And the only way they trust us is, is if we've built relationships with them, strong relationships. So that's number two. And then the third piece is the famous growth mindset. So embracing failures and mistakes as opportunity to learn and grow, 
versus something to be ashamed of or, you know, worse, sweep under the carpet. And that's hard. I own that. But those are the, the three main pillars. So radical humility equals now leadership. Yeah. And then you talk about the five shifts that have to happen to get from the, you know, then leadership to the now leadership of radical humility. And the first one really goes into that self-awareness piece. And I think it's, I just finished the book, The Power Code, which is by Katie, Katie Kay and uh, Claire Shipman, Katty Kay and Claire Shipman. They wrote a book called The Confidence Code as well. And in that book, they talk about the studies that show that leaders tend to be less self-aware and less empathetic as they gain more power. Um, I, there was one, it was really interesting, one of the studies that they cited that said that leaders got worse manners as they became more powerful. You know, they ate with their mouth open and talked with their mouth open and all of this. And so how, if that is something that seems to happen as people get into positions of power, how do you encourage them or what tools can we give people to be more self-aware? So, and of course, what you're saying or what they're, what they're writing about is absolutely true. The higher we rise, the less we hear the truth, yeah. right? We, yeah. we, and so I think some of the things that I encourage my clients to do is you need to have people in your network who actually tell you the truth. And so you need to be strategic around who you surround yourself with. That's right. And so, because, you know, people don't laugh at your jokes. They laugh at your position's jokes. You know, you switch out the person and they laugh at the same jokes um, because of the position. And so the um, the notion of having people in a network who tell you the truth. And the second piece I'm, I'm thinking about here is what I do write about in the book, taking proactive steps to increase my self-awareness by asking people how they see me, where can, can I do better? And honestly, it doesn't matter if you're first line supervisor the CEO of Microsoft or the president of the US, we can all ask our network. We all have blind spots. We all have things we don't do perfectly. What are mine? And encourage that open um, um, conversation. Yeah, I think it's so important. And it sort of brings us to the shift number two, tough on results, tender on people, because there you're talking about feedback as well. So there's the feedback that we want to get to be more self-aware, and then the feedback that comes with being tough on results and tender on people. And what does a leader, well, an individual, what do you do if you're uncomfortable with feedback or you're dealing with someone else who is uncomfortable with feedback? Um, leadership is a contact sport, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so that is true. Also, I believe if you don't love people, you shouldn't lead people. I actually believe that to be true as well. So if you're uncomfortable with feedback, you got to practice. I mean, I, I really, there, there's no better way to, to put this. You got to practice giving it and you got to practice receiving it. And this can start in our personal lives, with our partners, with our kids, with our, uh, with our siblings. And so uh, the best answer I can really give, if you're really uncomfortable with feedback, you need to practice to get comfortable because without feedback, you're not developing as a leader. And so, you know, I talk about, you know, the good old 360s, which have been around for decades, of course, and, you know, we can debate the, the validity of it. But I still believe it is a very, very useful tool to actually give us data, not evidence, as you often point out, the difference, right? As a former defense attorney, data on how people see me. So if you're uncomfortable with feedback, do an anonymous 360. Yeah. And then um, uh, you have a data point. Well, and the thing is, it, it really goes back to your growth mindset, you know, because I, I, you know, I struggled especially when I was younger with feedback, you know, in the courtroom, sometimes the judge would have us go back and talk to the jury after a trial was over. And if I won, I'd be like, oh yeah, great. I'd love to go in there and talk. But on the occasions where I lost, I was like, I don't want to in front of everyone. What if they say I was terrible? And the feedback that you receive in any situation can only help you as long as you think about it that way and sort of shift your perspective. So you have to have the growth mindset that it's only going to make me better. And I can pick and choose what are the feedback I want to, you know, work on and try to get better at and other things that I might think aren't as important, but at the very least, be open to the feedback. 
I think it's a, a phenomenal thing. You also talk quite a bit about the importance of trust. Tell me about where that fits in with humility, the, the ability to trust the, your team members and team members to trust the leader. How does that fit in with radical humility? So it, it fits in with vulnerability. So the, the quickest way to build trust is by actually showing up with vulnerability. And I talk in the book about the fascinating study where pairs of complete strangers get brought into a lab and they're asked for 45 minutes to ask and respond to meaningful questions. Like what does love and friendship mean to you? If you had a year to live, what would you change? And then they're asked to rate the level of trust they have with that person of 45 minutes. And they rate the level of trust with a person of 45 minutes about as high as the average person in their lives. And some even as high as the trust they have with their significant other. One pair got married. I think I write about this in the book. So yeah. the, the research is crystal clear that appropriate vulnerability, and we can talk about what that looks like, is the fastest way to increase increased trust. And being able to be vulnerable has to do with being able to be self-aware, and that's how it ties back into, um, into humility. And then also an important point here too is, and people often challenge me, you know, how can I be confident and humble? And I actually really think that they go hand in hand. If it, it, I need the confidence that I'm fundamentally okay. I have many strengths. And so I can actually hear the feedback. So when you're in the courtroom and you lost, you walk in, you know you're a great defense attorney. And yes, you too have things you can or need to work on, but you fundamentally go in from a, from a, point, from a position of confidence and strength. So then you can hear the feedback. Um, the critical feedback. So that's an other important point to make when it comes to humility and confidence. I love, there's a bunch of things I want to follow up on, but I love that you said that part because I do, you know, I read another book, um, Energy Rising. It's a great book. And it, she, uh, it's Dr. Julia Deganji. She's a neuroscientist. And she talks about how the hardest emotion for humans is shame. And, you know, Brene Brown and vulnerability, this all kind of goes together. But if you have a strong sense of self-worth, which comes from the awareness that you talk about at the beginning of the book, then you can manage vulnerability and you can handle negative feedback and you can handle all of the things that you're talking about. But it really comes down to that belief in yourself and the core of yourself that has to come first. I did, I'm so glad that you brought up that study, Ors, because. I loved that study. I had never heard it before about the two groups and the group sharing, you know, some of the deeper conversations. What I did wonder about, and I wanted to ask you about with that study is in that setting, the questions were part of the research. And so it wasn't uncomfortable or as uncomfortable, one might imagine, than if I just walked into the office of my secretary on next week and said, so what's, what are you most afraid of the not doing before you die? <laughs> So how can we set people up to have these vulnerable conversations? Well, that's a great question. You're, of course, absolutely right. It is a, a lab environment. I think the important piece to remember here is that you, you display different levels of vulnerability with different people. Like when I talk about tough and results, tender and people, building relationships, it's the same thing. I'm okay with having various depth of relationships and displaying various levels of vulnerability with different people. So we, we might have people on our team where we're actually comfortable having this conversation about end of life and all the rest of it. But with other people, it might simply be sharing, it sounds mundane, I know, but sharing what, how I spent my weekend. It might be sharing a little challenge I have with my teenage boys. I have two teenage boys, plenty of challenges, I can tell you that. So, so <laughs> and this is why, you know, I. I, I often say leadership is a thinking person sport. So you have to be a, adaptable to varying varying um, settings and display different levels of vulnerability. But the point still stands. And I think that's an important one to make that as a society, as a business society, certainly in the US and in the Western world, we do not do enough sharing. We do not show up with enough vulnerability. And by the way, you know, I don't need to tell you everything. I don't need to tell you about, you know, the fight with my teenage boy last night necessarily. So I need to really judge 
how each conversation goes and how much I reveal. So this is the give and take. Yeah, and I think it's so important. It's interesting because early in my um, career as a speaker and writing my books and so forth, I kind of pushed back against vulnerability, to be honest, because I really saw in the courtroom, I would never encourage my clients to be vulnerable. They already felt so vulnerable on the witness stand. I would encourage them to be credible. And there's this fine line there. And I do think that credibility and trust run together. But over time, I have come to recognize what Brene Brown says about vulnerability is that people have to earn it. And as you just pointed out so beautifully, there's different levels. And it can be the vulnerability of saying, this is what I brought for lunch if, if you know, for the first time. That, yeah. And it's exactly. sometimes just small talk is the beginning of vulnerability. That's exactly right. I mean, I think I have an exercise actually in my book, literally how you start to have a conversation to go into more depth. So it can absolutely start with small talk. And I mean, one last piece around this, you know, we often say everybody admires perfection from a distance. Nobody can relate to it. Okay, so, and Brené Brown says, you know, vulnerability is the last thing I want to show and the first thing I'm looking for in you. And so let's remember that when we're, when we're thinking about how to deepen relationships. I, I love that you said that. It's funny, one of my friends was talking to me and she we were talking about uh, romantic relationships and she was saying perfectionism isn't sexy. And it's not, it's not attractive. It doesn't have a, a, a magnetic energy, whether you're standing on a stage, whether you are in a conference room, whether you're on screen with a Zoom, there's an energy that perfectionism gives off that is not magnetic. It's not appealing. It's not one that people want to get closer to. And so yeah. we all have to sort of be aware of that and recognize that you are not magnetic when you are a perfectionist or even when you're perfect. And yeah. I think that that will help people to be less driven towards perfectionism. Yeah. Can I say one more? Sorry, oh, Henry. Of course, yeah, yeah. About this, I want to be very clear though. Humility and vulnerability and transparency, the things we just talked about, there are no replacement for competence. I want to be crystal clear about this. There's all the sharing, all the relationship building in the world does not help you as a leader if you lose your company tens of millions of dollars. And so I want to be super clear about this. That's not a replacement. I mean, I'm a, you know, ultra endurance guy. I'm a military guy. I, 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 I want deliverables. I want results. And so I think it's really a lot of speakers talk about belonging and, 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 and relationship building. And that's absolutely important, but it's important to me. And that's why it's the badass leader to at the same time, deliver results. And you, and you speak about that so beautifully in the book, and I couldn't agree more. And again, I go back to, for me, the discussion around trust, for me, always comes back to credibility. Because trust takes time to build, but credibility can happen sooner. And a lot of that is based on, you know, do you believe that I can do the thing I say I'm going to do? Do you, do I make promises and keep them? Do you know, do I set expectations and meet them? Do I meet the quotas? You know, it's the competence piece that you talk about and the clarity of communication those things. And that really has to be the foundation before you can, you know, because I could go around all day saying, oh, I'm terrible. And this is terrible. But that's not going to, uh, you know, impress my board, my employees, my stakeholders. And at the end of the day, I'm not getting things done. So and you and you really address that beautifully in the book in a way that is, um, it's very clear where you stand. I do want to just touch upon your endurance athlete background. How do you think that that has played into, and you talk about it a bit in the book, and especially towards the beginning, there's a picture of you and skiing, I know, is a big sport for you. How do you think that that has influenced the way that you approach radical humility in the book? So competing at the you know relatively high level, there's no more humbling experience than that because you get your butt kicked on a regular basis. I mean, that's just, and, and so you learn to lose yes. early on. And so that's, I mean, I know we all talk about how, why we send our kids to, to play sports. So that's certainly um, a big one. But the second piece really, and maybe more important is how I learned to deal with those failures. I talk about the Race Across America story where I almost died, had to virtually peel me off the bike. And it was such a hard loss for me, so painful. I was so closely attached to the race. I couldn't finish the race. I was ending up in ICU. 
that when the race went, I went with it. So, you know, my identity was so tight. And so the deep hard work I had to do to come back from that loss. And that is, again, the growth mindset. How do I, you know, I fail. I'm flooded with shame, guilt, embarrassment. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. How do I shift from being flooded by these emotions to learning from the experience? So that's probably the biggest thing that has shaped me and that has informed the book as well. No, and it really comes back to what we talked about a little bit ago about that self-worth inside that because it's so easy as a leader, at no matter who you are listening, to identify with a role or a goal or something that you want to be known as. And, you know, for me, it was the winning trial attorney or the person who best served their clients. And when you miss the mark to not let it ruin you. And so that you can come back and have a new identity or, or embrace the growth and embrace the feedback and embrace the loss and learning to lose, I think is something that we don't talk about enough because it is a skill, right? Yeah. To be able to lose. And I think it's great that we talk about that with regards to putting our children into sports or putting them into opportunities where they don't always get the trophy and get the thing so that they can learn the skill of removing themselves from the identity as winner. Yeah, you know, and I was, this is not from me, but somebody said, you know, we're human beings, not who human doings, right? So, you know, really, who am I after all the things I do, speaking, writing, whatever else, leading my team, being on boards, who am I as a person after all that doing falls away? Yeah, yeah, I think that it's um, it's such an important conversation. I, and, it, and it's a through line through the book, this right. ultimate idea that at, with, with humility, you have got to have that sense of who you are without all the bells and whistles that come along with being a leader um, or any identity that we sort of embrace. There's one thing that on page 147, I loved this because it's something that I often talk about in my keynotes. I don't know that I talked about it in any of my books, but in my keynotes, and it is in my keynotes, I talk about you have to repeat something in order to get it across to your team or anyone that you have to repeat it nine times, nine ways. You say 150 <laughs> times, seven different ways. Tell us a little bit about how important that is. So I think... Um, uh... That's funny that you also talk about this. So it is incredibly difficult for us to be heard, for anybody to be heard. And I think we we totally as leaders underestimate how much effort it requires for our message to actually come across. And so I talk about in the book that I sort of pulled that 150 times seven different ways out of you know where. And when I was leading <laughs> the CEO peer groups, and uh, but studies actually show that. I think I quote a study in there where people who are tasked with executing strategy in their company couldn't name the three main strategic goals of their company. And so um, the way I think about this and the way I coach leaders, when you hear yourself in other people, when you have them paraphrase back to you what you constantly say, number one, and when you cannot stand yourself anymore repeating the same thing, like, then you're heard. So yeah. that's my rule of thumb. That's right. Yeah, no, I loved it. And I love the seven different ways because I do, you know, oh. in the courtroom with juries, different jury members hear and receive things in different ways. Some like pictures, some like stories, some like data, some like graphs, some are into like specific statistics and what's the research say. And so the more ways that you can communicate something, the more likely you are to touch different people, whether it's on your team and your jury, and I put that in quotes, of your team whose belief you want to build, or whether it's a jury in the courtroom. And so when you said that, I was like, my goodness, we are of the same mind and heart because it is important. And you do feel like a broken record. But if you challenge yourself to share it in different ways, sometimes that feels a little less broken record. And you're absolutely right. So the seven different ways, I mean, that's also true for us as speakers. Yes, yes. We, we use stories. We use models, That's we it. use metaphors, That's we right. use humor, we use the stage. So, it, and it's the same for us as leaders. Is it, you know, I, you can use the same, it's the same models actually. So it, it, written, verbally, seven different ways. So yeah. uh, the more the merrier. 
Yeah. And it's, and it's fun to sort of see what sticks and what actually builds belief, you know, um, the, the re repetition, alliteration, you know, you can, you can get a little bit playful with all of this. And I think that's another thing. I mean, first of all, you know, you've got these five shift swords and I love your language, you know, shift number one is dig deep. Shift number two is tough on results, tender on people. Three, lead like a compass. I love that visual, right? It's so, um, it really shows what you're talking about in that shift. And then four is full transparency. And five is champion a fearless culture. Um, it is it is so good. And the other thing that I think, and I would love to just have you explain this to the listeners as we wrap up this is flown by. Um, the leadership now prompts and the QR codes in the book are phenomenal. Tell us a little bit about those. So I have prompts are basically exercises, right? So I call them now leadership, now prompts. So it was, so it was important to me that it's not just something you read and then put away, but something that I can actually apply immediately as a leader. And I often think back to when I used to do more executive coaching, I want two things. I want you to have different insights and I want you to do stuff differently on the ground in the real world. And if I can only have one, I have the second. So, so my goal really in the book was to make it personal, make it research-based, draw on other leaders' experiences and make it applicable so readers can immediately apply what I've talked about in the book um, with, with these exercises. So these are the prompts and then the QR codes there are, there's an assessment, the radical humility assessment, there is more book resources, there is more exercises, more research, there's plenty of stuff to dig in um, beyond the book as well. And for those of you looking on YouTube, the book is full of things like this, and it's full of charts and just, you know, it's sort of the seven ways of communicating even within this book. You've got different things that will appeal to different people. And I know um, in my first book, The Elegant Warrior, at the end of every chapter, I put like, you know, summary of the case, I called it. But people love that, especially people who are like, I don't know if I'm going to read this whole book. But to sort of pull out the parts that are most important, there's so much of that here. I have to tell you, you just went through a bunch of things that were your goals to make it research-based, to make it personal, to make it actionable. You hit everything you just said. So I, you really should be very proud of this book. Guys, it comes out on March 19th, but you can pre-order it now. Pre-orders make a huge difference to authors. So if this in conversation is interesting to you and you are a leader or, and you all are leaders, just as a reminder, you know, in our lives, in our families, in our homes, and in our communities, this is a book that you absolutely want to get. Before I let you go, I want to ask you two quick questions that we always end the podcast with. The first is about your favorite book or a book that you would recommend to my listeners. What's a book that you would recommend? So we talked about failure. My favorite book that came out last year is Amy Edmondson's, and I have it here, by the way. Look at me being prepared. <laughs> the right kind of wrong. This is, I actually just posted about this today on LinkedIn. So Amy Edmondson, of course, as many of us know, is the queen of psychological safety at Harvard. She um, talks about the science of failing and really puts a scientific, personal, um, research-based uh, lens on the science of failing. So I love this book. It's my favorite book from last year. I love, I, I was lucky enough to share a stage at Stanford MedX with Amy and she came on my podcast, I think it was the public facing one. I know she came on, I have a podcast that serves medical residents and her background is, um, she does a lot of studies at Mass General with doctors, nurses. And in that book, there's a lot about doctors and nurses. She's not only an amazing author and researcher, but just a really cool person. And so that book is a, a fabulous new, I think, seminal work on failure. So it's a great recommendation and we will definitely put it in the uh, show notes. Yep. Before I ask the very final question, where can people find more about you if they want to hire you as an executive coach or to bring you into their organization or to have you do a keynote? What's the best place for us to send them? Best place is my website, urskoenig.com, U-R-S-K-O-E-N-I-G.com. That's the best way to find me. Of course, I'm on social as well. So yeah. Okay. And we will uh, put a link to that in the show notes as well. And then the last question is my favorite question. And your answer to this question will go on the Elegant Warrior Spotify playlist. What is your theme song? My theme song? 
So I thought about this actually for a little bit, believe it or not. And so I, I'm obviously an athlete. So I work out a lot. And before I go on stage and when I work out, one of my favorite songs is Rachel Platten's Fight Song. Oh, I love it. So, uh, you know, and I, I sometimes... Obviously, this is the elegant pot, elegant word podcast. I think of elegance actually maybe less in terms of effortless and uh, graceful, but somebody who embraces the suck, who embraces <laughs> the struggle, who embraces the fight, and so the fight, you know, with myself primarily. So, anyway, that that's uh, that's why that's my theme song. I love it, and I love that song, and we will definitely add it. Urs, thank you so much for this beautiful book. Thank you for coming on and sharing your insights with my audience. And I hope that everyone goes out and gets it and learns from it and embraces radical humility. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. Appreciate it.